It is another episode of Amjambo Time. Thank you for all who help us to broadcast this unique program. I want to welcome our listeners in the main and around the world. Here are our headline stories. John Tenth in the main. Celebrations of the holiday took place all over the state. We were at symposium at USM. And most of my friends at the Y were black kids from Hartford. And uh, I would visit them in their homes, and they came and visited me in my home. Stay tuned. A welcoming Sanford, one Sanford resident, is helping new arrivals find a shelter. Maine Ecojustice is advocating for rent relief, among other measures they want lawmakers to take in the face of the housing crisis. In this show, we have renowned artist Antonio Hosha, who talks about his career. At Amjamba Africa, we bring new Mainers together with all Mainers. This is a collaboration between Amjamba Africa and WMPG of Southern Maine, University 90.9 FM. My name is Jaha Kuziman, and I'm your host. Thank you for tuning in. Black Americans still face challenges 160 years after emancipation and the abortion of slavery. These challenges, along with history, reflection, and talk of the way forward for black advancement, were discussed at the State of Black Maine Symposium held at University of Southern Maine on June 10th. Prominent multi generational black Mainers like Gerald Talbot Ross were in attendance, and so were new Mainers. To understand the history, I talked to Maine's NWSP, Rob Stewart. The NWSP always had uh, annual, after King was killed, mm. uh, annual dinners mm. in the biggest hotels in Portland. Mm. And there would be 100, 200 people there. Mm. And, you know, without the NWSP, that doesn't happen. Mm. The communities don't get together. Yeah. And uh, and make a common voice mm. about inclusion mm. and what is uh, how not to mistreat people. Mm. What do you remember by then about black people? Their situation. How was it? Can no, you describe I, that? I started out mm. even in high school mm. back in the sixties uh, and 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 late 50s, uh, very aware of racism. And when I went to college, I got very involved in the civil rights movement. And I have been involved in social justice issues ever since, uh, what I care about. Uh, I, 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 I do have, you know, I, I went to college, I ended up with a PhD. I taught at Princeton for a while, and then I left teaching because I felt I was already too radical to really fit into traditional jobs, and I wanted to be building communities that made a difference and not just made money. Mm, yeah, so I'm trying to see, like, um, today we are in, uh, we are like 60 years after. That's right. Yeah, so right. can you try to tell us some memories that you remember about how horrible the situation was for black people by then, you know, so that even young people they can understand, you know, from your voice and from your experience by then. You said in high school, what did you see by then that can tell us how the situation was looking like by then? Well, there are too many stories. I mean, I, I joined a YMCA in Hartford. I lived in the next to I uh, next to Hartford, uh, and most of my friends at the Y were black kids from Hartford, and uh, I would visit them in their homes, and they came and visited me in my home, and so that that's where the uh, 
my original kind of awareness of contrasting and how people were treated, how life was lived. And uh, so I've always chosen to be part of a diverse community. And I think I always felt that the, that the problem with America was the elitism the economic and social divides that cause people to live in inner cities or suburbs and I never wanted to live in a suburb again and that's one reason I as an adult I came to Maine when you see the 90 the 60s and now we are 60 years after do you feel any progress no that has been I, I, there's been a there that's too simple an answer. Mm. Yes, there are progress in some areas, mm. but the real divide is the economic divide mm. that has been structurally built into how this country operates so that people of color, and, and I mean all people of color, mm. are pretty much by law, it's very difficult for them to get any kind of economic basis. You know, you know all the stories about redlining neighborhoods, redlining black people, no loans, can't buy a house, you know, the, how the real estate world kept segregation in neighborhoods. So those things haven't really changed very well. Poverty is now the new race. The poor people are the black people. You know, 42 different shades of brown. Yeah. So, and, and poor people, poor is just another shade of brown in this country. Mm. Then how do we build again the momentum? How do we, do you want people to go back on the, the defense or the offensive? On the offense, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I love Martin Luther King. Mm. I love James Farmer mm. and the uh, the Freedom Rise of, and the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm. had good friends who went to different areas in the South and mm. got shot and mm. put in prison for six years until mm. the federal government forced them to be released on the basis of their being traded because they were white people we're trying to mess up with this southern system. Mm. I did the same thing in the north. I was part of a group that started the northern student movement. Rosa Barbosa, who has her finger on the pulse of business for black people in Maine, says that black entrepreneurs still face obstacles in Maine. What well, we need culturally relevant resources, we need this, we need that, we need language access, etc. But at the end of the day, there's still a system, right? There's still a government, there's still structural racism. So we can do all the best job in the world, but if the system that has been created for us, not by us, if the system that has been created for us is not also, you know, moving forward, then there's only so much you can do, right? There's only so much you can do, and I think that's why organizations like Black on Main are so important, because we're saying, you know what, that's cool. But we're just going to keep doing what we're doing anyway, <laughs> regardless of what is being presented to us. So what are the real steps or concrete activities that you're doing, you know, at like Brack on Main yeah. to navigate the water? Oh, yeah. So uh, so I'll name, I guess, the top three. So or top three. I don't know. We'll name the top ones. <laughs> so the biggest one is the is a directory. So we have a directory of the black businesses in Maine. So it's not just a directory. It's a resource that can be used inside the community, outside the community, um, between consumers and businesses, between business and businesses, colleges like the one we're at can use it to, you know, to diversify their vendors. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a technical assistance program. So there are many technical assistance, business technical assistance and advising programs in Maine. But I'll tell you, Almost none of them will have a person, let alone a person of color, let alone a black person who is able to come in and build that relationship to say, okay, you know what, you've been operating as a sole proprietor for X amount of years. 
Let's do your paperwork. Let's get you your LLC. Let's get you your business bank account. Let's separate the two. We're really trying to bridge that that cultural gap and say like, hey, we are our best teachers. Just like a history, a historian is the best person to teach history. You know, just like uh, maybe a fluent Spanish speaker is the best to teach Spanish. Black entrepreneurs are the best to teach black entrepreneurs. So how do you assess the status of black industry in the main? Is it something going on? A good story moving on? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, I would say things are definitely moving. But wow, there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. Um, I think lots of businesses, new businesses are popping up every day. I'm always driving saying, oh, wait, that looks like a black owned business. That looks like a black owned business. But we don't have, like, like the panelists said, we don't have supports always from the outside community. We don't really, maybe we don't have the money. Maybe again, we don't have the the systematic knowledge of how this country and how this state works maybe back home we were doing a business one way and it was going really well but then you bring that same idea to america and it doesn't work you know in america so i think that for me again it's going back to the basics going back to the foundation saying okay you have a great idea you're very you're innovating this and that but let's put a little bit of a barrier around that to ensure that you can continue to move forward otherwise if you don't have this basic knowledge things will just unfortunately crumble after so long, you know? A welcoming Sanford is one of the dream for Marcia Farmer, a Sanford resident who opted to host an immigrant family and who is looking forward to rally the community to contribute to helping new asylum seekers from those who are arriving in May. Marcia talked to Amjambo Time I am personally hosting a family who was told by the city of Sanford they could not stay because we're at capacity. And so I took them into my home because there's no room in Portland either. And I've just been kind of bouncing around on the fringes with things in Sanford, helping where I can. But now that I'm housing a family, it's become a little more difficult. How welcome is the city of Sanford? Because what happened We've got a lot of people and they're concentrating in Portland. And um, the idea was to push that more cities can get involved and yes. you know, share the, the pain that the, the city is having, the Portland city is feeling or facing. And then, yes. So, how do you see Sanford getting in and chipping? Um, in? It was a rough start. But I think they're starting to put some pretty good systems in place. Um, there is a temporary shelter that they opened. Um, it's Other options are being looked at for longer term with various organizations. Um, that was something that was discussed today. Um, the general messaging for new arrivals has been, we're at capacity, you have to go back to Portland. But I do know that there has been a church that has taken in some of the new arrivals. I don't know how many people at this point. Mm. Um, but it's, like I said, a rocky start, but they seem to kind of be getting their feet underneath them and understanding a little more, you know, what we're facing. Mm. Um it is an all hands on deck effort. And it's one of the things that I've noticed is the lack of coordination between municipalities mm -hmm. um, as asylum seekers go from community to community trying to find help. And I think that would be really important to put in place. So that can be on a state level? To yes. Yes, um, the state definitely should get more involved than what they have been. Um, mm -hmm. I know currently um, York County specifically has not gotten help from the state, but that is in the works, mm -hmm. um, I heard today. So, you know, with any luck, if their help as well, something can be worked out. So you are in the community, you are making your best to help and uh, how is the community understanding because sometimes it plays a big role. You know, when the community gets it, uh, things can move fast and quickly. But when they don't understand what's going on, why people are coming in, and uh, you, who are those guys? Why are they even coming in our cities? So <laughs> how is the ambience in the community around you? Um, it's mixed. 
Mm. Uh, there's a lot of community members that have, you know, stepped forward and been helping. Um, I have seen community members with the latter mindset that you just mentioned change their minds. Mm. Um, now that it's, you know, the wave of asylum seekers is here in Sanford. They seem to understand a little more now that they've met them and, you know, mm. are able to see and hear with their own eyes, despite what, you know, their media tells them. Um, but there is um, some pushback. I've mainly seen it on like the local Facebook pages, you mm. know, how those, you know, how those can go. Yeah. Um, there yeah. are some people that are not so welcoming. Mm -hmm. um but i i feel that the majority of people are welcoming main eco justice is pushing advocacy on ld 1710 the home act among the component for this bill is to advocate for a rent relief this session has really been on Mm -hmm. LD 1710, um, also known as the Home Act, which included many things. Um, but one of them that we're really lifting up still is that is rent relief. Um, so rent relief is really needed to bridge the affordability gap for many low income renters, um, as we've seen as the emergency rental assistance program was really widely used by people all across the state, um, from Presque Isle to Portland. Um, and so Unfortunately, LD 1710 is tabled and it will be carried over to the next session, um, but we are still advocating very hard for rent relief to be included in the budget mm. right now. And we would encourage anybody to reach out to their legislators um, and tell them how important rent relief is. Mm. So can you explain it into wider terms, that relief that you're mentioning, you know? Uh, so what do you intend to accomplish? And uh, of course, you mentioned that people can call, can participate. You can also elaborate more on that, how they can reach out. Is, is it safe? Everyone can reach out. And uh, yeah, you know, from asylum seekers to every group that you want to mention. So there are some other solutions happening for housing right now um, that are included or being included in the budget. Um, and those are really important pieces for housing. It includes building more affordable housing. It includes a housing first model, which is a program for individuals who experience chronic homelessness, um, which would cover roughly 600 individuals in Maine. And it has funding for emergency shelters, um, but the budget does not currently include a solution for people at or below 30% of area median income in Maine. That's kind of this like odd term area median income that we use, but it's a um, a sort of guidepost of how we determine um, people's eligibility based on their family size and their income. So 30% of AMI in the state or area median income translates roughly to $21,000 for a family of three, which I think everybody knows is really not a lot or enough money um, to cover all of your needs, including uh, the really high rates of rent right now. Mm -hmm. So this rent relief would provide um, it would make up the gap between what's affordable for people. And usually affordability is determined at paying 30% of your income um, mm -hmm. towards rent. And then th this rent relief would help make up the rest of that gap to what you actually owe. Um, why this is so important in this moment is because of those other pieces that are already included in the budget. They're capturing these other categories of people for the most part. We've got housing first, which is gonna capture people facing chronic homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, we've got funding to build more affordable housing, which we know is very much needed in the state. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got money to include for emergency shelters. Um, but unfortunately, none of these solutions capture extremely low income people in Maine. Mm -hmm. um, the affordable housing that's built is actually not affordable to the most low income Mainers in the state. Um, mm. It only captures down to a certain extent, but people, as I mentioned, at or below that 30% of area median income rate won't be able to afford affordable housing. I often hear people say, well, we don't have enough housing as it is. So where do you expect people to use this rent relief? Um, and what I frequently say to people is that we have 
a lot of people precariously housed right now, people who were housed and who were able to be housed and who had the most housing stability they may have ever had throughout the pandemic when emergency rental assistance and other programs were available to help them make up those differences. And without rent relief in this moment, those people will likely face eviction um, in the coming months as their rent is unaffordable. They're not having any of that to help make up make up that gap that they need. Um, and it is truly urgent. The eviction dockets in the main courthouses right now are setting records um, and rent prices, as we know, keep going up more and more. And the renters just continue to become extremely cost burdened. What I've said this session is that rent relief is needed to both keep people housed as well as to house people who are in the midst of an eviction or who have been evicted and to get them rehoused so that they can remain safe and stable. We know that housing is really the crux of what makes an entire well-being of a family and an individual. And without that, it can be really, really difficult to maintain a number of other things in their lives. Full-time performer artist Antonio Rocha is known in Maine and around the world. During Juneteenth celebration, Antonio Rocha performed the solo show called the Malaga Slave Ship. Antonio sat with him jumbo time after the performance, and he has more to share about his career. My name is um, Antonio Rocha. It spells R-O-C-H-A, but it's pronounced Hasha, and uh, like Russia with an H, mm. Hasha. Mm. I come from Brazil. I've been in Maine for 35 years. Wow. And I am a um, full-time performer. Mm. And I mix a combination of movement, mime, mm. and verbal narrative. Mm. And I've been performing it my entire adult life. I have several stories in my repertoire. I have various topics. I have environmental topics, um, tops of tolerance and respect. I um, performed a lot for young audiences, so I have a lot of uh, stories, folk tales that connect with curriculum in various schools, right? But I also have a, a, a repertoire for adults, mm -hmm. which are, uh, some of them are very funny, some of them are not. Um, mm -hmm. But these stories are told to adult audiences. Mm -hmm. And they vary from comedy pieces about situations I found myself into, but it's not stand up. Mm -hmm. They're just f funny stories mm -hmm. of things that I have to face mm -hmm. as a human being. Yeah. And then I have some uh, uh, poetic uh, toned stories about my parents' childhood in Brazil, my childhood in Brazil mm. and uh, so I have a lot of folk tales as I mentioned from Africa and uh, South America mm. and I also do historical stories mm. such as the one I did today the slave ship called Malaga mm. a slave ship called Malaga is um it's main history, it's Brazilian history, and it's personal history. Can you tell us the most memorable moments of your career? Uh, oh, I have many so memorable moments. Mm. Um, One that performing for the coming. yes, mm. performing for the Kennedy Center was a very memorable one. Mm. What happened? Uh, I, well, I performed at the Kennedy Center. <laughs> so what did you perform? How was the audience? The audience was great. Yes, it was great. Yeah. And yeah. My first performance at the National Storytelling Festival. That was huge. Wow. Uh, the National Storytelling Festival is mm. over 50 years old. Mm. And you perform in front of 2,000 people, 1,500 people. Mm. And all, mostly adults. And, mm. and it's, a, it's a career-making event in Tennessee mm. and to be a storyteller and be invited to be featured there mm. is a huge career moment really yes huge career moment mm. 
Um, so that was amazing when I did it for the first time in the year 2000. So I want to see how you think about the art to counter the narrative that is against the black slavery, but also to, to convict the opinion uh, of those who are still, you know, skeptical. So the, the push to deny the history comes from fear. If there is no fear, if there is no push and no awakening to the fact that these things happen, there wouldn't be anybody trying to hide it. So the hiding strategy, the denying, uh, denying strategy of many is a symptom that a lot of people are waking up to the fact that it happened. So it is a good sign, actually, when you think about it. You know, it's like, do you want to promote something? Try to hide it. Deny it. Try to deny it. Be as loud as you want. Go for it. Say it didn't happen, because the more you say it didn't happen, the more, the more people are going to say, they're going to, they're going to read books, they're going to create price. stories. They're going to <laughs> it's, no, it's like if you want to promote a good book, mm. say you should be burned. Everybody's going to read a book. <laughs> so you see the, it backfires so big time. The uh, is going to come in full circle. Yes, yes. And uh, so I feel very honored. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I feel honored and touched that I've been presented with this, with this story and I am able to touch people's minds and hearts through the telling of it. Yeah. And, it's, uh, it, and, it, and I do everything I've done in the 30 years I've been performing. I, I, you know, well, more than 30. I've been in Maine for 35 years and I started performing in Brazil. So I've been performing for like 37 years. Your leaders, come your children, be united for the peace and your children's welfare. Enemy of Africa, should that be an African? Only you Africa. We have come to the end of today's Amjambo time. Thank you for tuning in. Please keep an eye on WMPG and the Amjambo Africa website for a podcast of this show and more news we are covering in Maine. And remember, I'm Jumbo Time alternates with our newest show, We Remain, on air in Kinyarwanda and Chirund on alternate Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and available by podcast at amjambafrica.com and on our YouTube channel. Stay tuned for news about Bonjour Maine our newest podcast out soon to be broadcast entirely in French. I'm Jumbo Time is brought to you by Jacques Kuziman. Have a great day. Africa,